this is Harriet Grayson. Yes, and I am the producer and host of Community Culture Showcase. We like to bring you the best of culture here in Southeast Connecticut and Southern Rhode Island. But listen, because of YouTube, you can see us around the world. It's that easy. And this show will be there too. And I have a great honor to present an actress, a true Renaissance woman, an actress, a producer, a playwright, are there any more adjectives that I've missed? Teacher. Teacher. Mother. Oh, gosh. Mo Manager. Mother. Yes. <laughs> so welcome, Sandra Tal Lau. I messed uh, up your name for, you know, uh, it should be something else, but I made it up. I am thrilled to be here, Harriet. Yeah. I loved Frank's opening for you. That gilded stage is perfect because so, yes. that's exactly what Mrs. Campbell would have loved. Oh, wonderful. So tell yeah. us a little bit about you with all of those adjectives and how you got started in this racket oh, my and goodness. your latest adventure. My latest adventure. Well, let's start. Where shall we start? Start at the beginning. Start at the very beginning? Start at the beginning. I, you know, I landed in uh, Pawkatuck, Connecticut, coming from New York. Uh, I was brought up in New Rochelle, New York, New Rochelle High School. Hello to all my friends uh, in New York. I uh, ended up going to, new, to the city quite often to see shows, to see plays, to see theater. Our director of the drama program at New Rochelle High School was Gene Feist, who made a name for himself as the producer-director of the Roundabout Theater, which we all know now as being a premier theater on Broadway. But we got to see him and plays off-Broadway. It was down in the, almost in the village, I think, when I went to high school. And that became my, my love, my passion. I did plays in high school, as many of us did, and musicals, and uh, wrote uh, for the school newspaper, did Model Congress, you know, all those extracurricular activities. And uh, then after my high school days, I went to Northwestern University, which is a fabulous, fabulous university for theater communications, radio, TV, film, all of that. Right. Julia Louis-Dreyfus went to Northwestern. There mm -hmm. are many, many famous names who went to Northwestern. I did alternative theater at Northwestern University. I did hair. The musical mm -hmm. with a bunch of people and in fact when we talk about the play that I'm here to promote Mrs. Campbell and Mr. Shaw I will tell you that our stage manager for the hair 40 years ago or more now um, our stage manager is now my Mr. George Bernard Shaw his name is Rob Mendel, and it's like a full circle. Um, it's wonderful. It, it's, it's quite thrilling that, that Rob is able to do this, uh, this play with me and fill in. Um, so anyway, went to college, um, met the most extraordinary, talented people. It was there that I was exposed to British theater via the Royal Shakespeare Company, Anthony Schur. Sir Anthony Scher uh, came to Northwestern and did monologues, and that inspired me to memorize a Shakespearean mm -hmm. monologue, and it was that monologue that got me into American Conservatory Theater program. Uh, that's where I did my classical training. Uh, then spent a few years out in San Francisco, in California, uh, went to LA, tried to make myself into a movie person uh, that was tough I did some I did some work for Francis Ford Coppola uh, stood in for Terry Garr in a film from Francis Ford Coppola which was incredible um, but did theater there did theater West uh, out in uh, Los Angeles and all the time training all the time keeping my training up because once you've done conservatory training, you know that it takes practice. It's like being a musician, so you have to keep your technique going. Um, from L.A., I was asked to come back to New York to audition for New York's Shakespeare Theater, Joseph Papp. And uh, I was very, very lucky. I auditioned for a play called Richard III. 
Shakespeare. Shakespeare. Yes. Uh, and you know who first started? They're doing it this summer, I believe, another Richard III. Yes, yes. But I got to play with Kevin Klein. Oh, wonderful. Who was the Richard III at that point. Yes, yes. Oh, man, this was 1982 or three. Um, I still have the poster that uh, Kevin Klein signed for me, and most notably, um, Joseph Papp signed everybody's um, program. So I have that framed in my home in Pawkatuck now. And, uh, and that was thrilling, just thrilling to be in, um, in Central Park for uh, six, you know, four weeks rehearsing and I think two or three weeks playing. And uh, it wasn't a big part, but it was enough. Uh, I then worked at uh, Circle in the Square Theater okay. down in Sheridan Square. Mm -hmm. Got to see Ed Harris premiere, um, oh God, Sam, Shepherd, Sh Sam Shepard's play Fool for Love. Um, and that was a thrill. So, you know, Mabu Mines was there, mm -hmm. La Mama was there. I got to see uh, living theater, you know, all of the, the, you know, the happenings theater, the sort of event uh, type of theater. Absolutely. And of course, uh, and all these new plays that were happening. So that was a tremendous education for me. Um, and I wanted to do my own work, uh, so I started a theater with a friend of mine from England and some other folks in New York, we started something called Classic Works Theater, which was a Shakespeare. We did Shakespeare. We did restoration, uh, romantic restoration comedy. Uh, down in, I don't know if you remember it, there was a West Arts Theater Center down on the west side um, in the village. Uh, we got a little write up in the New Yorker. That was fun. <laughs> well, and I was at uh, school down there in the village at NYU. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I was it, and that began my teaching career. Oh, okay. Um, it was then that I did uh, because I was involved with um, an off-off Broadway theater called RAP, R A P P. Jeff Cohen. Shout out to Jeff Cohen, who now has a fabulous production of his play called The Soap Myth, starring some very big names. Ed Asner actually starred in his play. He was the artistic director. And I did many plays with Jeff. Um, and from there, I started my own um, classic company. And, uh, and we did restoration comedy. Uh, I then was got into, oh, and I was talking about theater um, uh, teaching, right? Right, yes, you, yes. What is it called? The uh, New School for... Uh, down at the New School. Right. The new That's school. where I first taught theater and acting and voice and movement at the New School. Um, we then, I then did uh, my own adaptation because I'm interested, I've always been interested in, of course, reading like you. You're mm -hmm. a writer. Uh, so I was interested in the classics and I took Madame Bovary, Flaubert's famous oh, yes. novel. Oh, yes. And I created a play for myself. And uh, I started it. We did it with uh, uh, a group that I paid. And <laughs> we had a great little theater. I think the theater is still there in the, um, in, the, in the village, down the East Village, the Crane Theater. And it was what I've seen that's done even more now by new theater companies, and that's adapting literature. Mm -hmm. It's what I learned at Northwestern, oral presentation, oral theater. Right. So taking any kind of literature, right. letting there be a narrator character, and letting all the characters take um, the dialogue, of course. So I turned the novel into a play, and that did very well, and that got me started in, in, in the theater uh, in New York on my own. And at the same time, lots of off-Broadway shows, lots of regional theater shows. Um, what else? I did a new play called Peacetime, um, first at Capitol Rep up in Albany. You know that because you're up in Buffalo, right? So, Well, not too close. Not too close. That's right. <laughs> new York's a big state. It is indeed. Uh, so regional theater there. Then we did it at WPA. And then 
I got married. <laughs> we, uh, we were living on the upper, upper, upper west side, close to Harlem at 125th Street. Oh, yes. And my daughter, Emma, was born and, uh, at, at New York Hospital. In fact, the night Nixon died, she was born that day. Oh. Uh, uh, which is another horror story that, that <laughs> we can talk about in our children and having children. <laughs> Uh, she's my one and only, um, and uh, she was two years old, and we were living up on Broadway, and the playgrounds were full of crack vials at that point. You know, it was tough. Yeah, the West Side. Yeah, the Upper Upper West Side. We had moms groups. You know, so my husband at that time got a job up with the Mashantuck at Pequots at Foxwoods. He was mm -hmm. working pro bono for them when they first got started, and uh, we moved. Oh, okay. So that took me from New York up to Rhode Island, and we moved to, we rented a house first at, uh, oh man, this 18th century farmhouse on a pond. It was bucolic. It was beautiful. I'm a romantic, so I fell in love with it. And there we were for just a couple of years. Um, and... Uh, I'm, I'm giving you the whole oh, yes, timeline yes, here. Yes, exactly, exactly. Uh, and I can relate to some of it because right? uh, you know, I went to Far Rockaway High School. And My grandmother lived in Far Rockaway. And I remember uh, fondly, part of the boardwalk. Our, yeah. yeah, part of our senior year, I, was, I had done all the stuff necessary for the Regents exam in English. So we had a, the, a theater, not that I was an actress, but part of the... Um, Part of the class was to go to all kinds of Broadway and off-Broadway shows. Oh, so like sure. every so week, every week they got us a bus and we went to see a show. So it was, you know, you could only do that if you were in or around absolutely. New York City. So that, that was, was our theater education from that, the absolutely best, from Broadway right. and off-Broadway. Uh, exactly right. The genius minds at work there. So you saw the Fantastics. We saw, uh, we saw, all, and my mother yeah. used to love to go to the theater. So we saw, yeah. I saw with her West Side Story. And some Do you remember seeing Fiddler on the Roof for the no, first time? No, no. I that, think we took my grandmother, and that I, didn't I think see. it was zero. I think it was uh, zero Mostel. Yeah, yeah. So, the, and then in uh, many years later, I w I lived on 88th and Broadway, and practically yep. every night I would see something because they used to have a thing. I don't know if they still do it. Is you TKTS. Go to a, forget that one. Go to the uh, box office. Yeah. Fifteen minutes before the show, and if oh, they have a any curtain. And if they have no, if they have empty seats for twenty bucks, you get a seat. Wow! I saw Chicago twice for now. stuff like that. Yeah. I saw a whole bunch of shows, and then of course some shows, absolutely not. It was they were sold out, or they, they didn't want to go along with the twenty bucks. Um, I lived at one hundred and third and Riverside Drive mm -hmm. in what I used to call the Ghostbusters building. Mm -hmm. And in the basement of that building was the Equity Library Theater. And I was lucky enough to live in a tiny little studio on like the 16th floor, I think. I'd go down at night and I did Three Sisters at Equity Library Theater. Wow. And it was a great commute. <laughs> so wow. anyway, I ended up in, in Rhode Island. Uh, at that point, I got a couple of jobs doing, um, doing theater, doing community theater. I worked at Brown uh, Summer Theater. Mm -hmm. I did their rep season. Uh, out of that, I got a job teaching theater and voice and movement and speech uh, for like five years at Brown University. And at the same time, also worked adjunct with URI. Paula McGlasson, thank you, Paula, hired me to teach at uh, URI, also acting voice and movement for seven years mm -hmm. before I got, because they didn't pay insurance, right? Mm -hmm. I had to get insurance, so I... I had been certified for teaching secondary school English in New York, got my certification, and brought it up to Rhode Island. And luckily enough, it'll be 20 years next year, I uh, got a job teaching high school English. Oh, okay. And have always kept my, my theater endeavors going. That is great. Yeah. That is, that great for your knock students. Knock on wood. Great for well, your I ran the theater department there for many years. I ran the creative writing uh, program and speech. Now they have a performance pathways that's genius. Young woman is is uh, leading that, mm -hmm. and you know, watch the credits for any movie around, and you can see how many jobs um, are in the arts. You know, well, so the uh, Connecticut for a while it changes from 
whatever politician might be in, the governor uh, about being generous about giving out tax credits, which bring yep. productions, both, uh, both theater, movies, TV, even video, to, to Connecticut. Rhode Island has played with it a little, not as they're aggressively. They're doing uh, the Gilded Age, I think they're doing up at Newport. One of my students actually did a, a little bit of extra work for them at the Breakers a couple okay. of, uh, last month. So, yes, yeah, so, so, yeah, yeah. The, some, yeah. some, for a long time, Connecticut uh, did not see value in its arts, mm -hmm. but of late, mm -hmm. they have seen it as an economic engine. Absolutely. Which it absolutely is, and it brings people, yep. if it's done well, it brings people from, like, New York, London, absolutely. Paris. It will bring people from all Meryl over Street the world. Meryl Streep did a movie that was uh, down in Stonington, I think, in the borough at Noah's Restaurant, yeah. So those things yep. happen with, uh, it, it takes a little incentive, uh, usually monetary, because exactly. nobody's in the business to lose money, usually. Well, once you get out of the hubs, out of L.A. or out of New York, and you want to keep doing theater, you've got to be your own manager. You've got to be your own producer, which is what I've done in the past uh, 20 years or so mm -hmm. while I've been teaching. I've kept my acting up. I was lucky enough to be hired by the great Ed Shea, who ran Second Story Theater in Rhode Island for many years. Um, and we did Golda's Balcony, okay. which is the William Gibson um, play about Golda Meir and the Yom Kippur War. And that was a one-woman show. I was terrified to do it. Uh, it was a great, nurturing, supportive theater company. And I did it for uh, however long, maybe a month. And there were talkbacks after the show, and synagogue started to call me up and wanted me to do the show for them. Okay. So since then, that was 2013, almost 10 years I've been doing Golda's Balcony, touring across the country to community centers and wow. synagogues and libraries. And Very nice. I, I carry her in my, in my suitcase, because you don't need many props. You need a black <laughs> telephone, like, you know, 1973. And a map of Israel. Yep, yep. And uh, I did it on Zoom. Mm -hmm. um, so let's see. There was Golda's Balcony, and I did I did you know dozens of other community uh, theater in Rhode Island and Connecticut. I right. was down in Chester for um, Sideman the show, uh, and that was I remember it was 9/11. It was mm. right after 9/11 we did it there. Um, so where I live in Pawkatuck is that border. It's that really interesting border of Rhode Island, Connecticut. You've got Westerly around the corner from where I live and Stonington right down the road. Right. Um, and I work with Dragon's Egg, Mystic Paper Beast, the great Maria Urson and her husband Dan Potter who do Mystic Paper Beast. Shout out to them um, with their amazing facility for all kinds of artists and groups to come and workshop whatever they're doing. Dance companies, uh, theater companies. Right. Mario always does a narrative event. Right. I've been going there for the past, you know, almost 20 years as well since I've been in the area. Well, the new cultural center, I think, which has recently opened in Westerly is, of course, United Theater. United Theater, theater. exactly. Which, um, got its backing not from the, the uh, revered town um, town fathers, but rather from a philanthropist. Sure. Exactly. The which is oftentimes George. what has to happen. Yes. Yes. Chuck Royce. Chuck Royce. Chuck Royce. Chuck Royce and his Shout money. Shout out to and Chuck. And, oh, yes. Well, the he sells a bookstore. Of, the town of Westerly would not be what it is today, which Absolutely. is a thriving arts community had it not been for that kind of stuff. And he continues yeah. to favor us with his, not only his largesse, but the very fact that our town council, school committee people think in yesterday, always thinking yesterday. Mm -hmm. They had maybe today, never tomorrow. And that's what you need. You need He's farsighted. He's a visionary. Absolutely. And that's the, there are everything few people from, like that. Uh, from, from helping with the YMC to expand and you know, bring in lots of kids Absolutely. and give them opportunities. And to, to tide United us States. all over during the last couple of years of COVID to right. keep those venues open. Um, shout out as well in Rhode Island to the Granite Theater. Yes. 
Yes. Um, I did this play, and maybe here's a time where we can segue a little okay. bit. Okay, yes. Uh, we can always go back, but um, in addition to uh, being hired by, by the universities uh, and by community theaters in both Rhode Island and Connecticut, I have other properties that I've adapted, one of which are the letters of George Bernard Shaw and Mrs. Patrick Campbell the venerated, uh, famous, uh, Gilded Age actress who was Eliza in Pygmalion, the play mm -hmm. that uh, George Bernard Shaw wrote. So I took their letters. I first did, well, that was the, the second theater company that I started with a group from URI. We did a play called Dear Liar. So shout out to Jerome Kilty, 1950-something, I will be honest, a, a, a very well-produced, much-produced play, but for me a little creaky and a little unfair to Mrs. Pat. So I decided to rewrite it. And I rewrote it to the extent that I got my own co copyright and renamed the play Mrs. Campbell, Mr. Shaw right. in dialogue. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was 20 years ago. Um, when I first moved to, uh, to, to this neck of the woods. And I've done this play, three different versions of it. I did it almost 20 years ago with the late, great Tom Oakes, a Rhode Island actor, uh, famous at the GAM, uh, just a beautiful man, and uh, it was really fun. We did it in Rhode Island at libraries. We did it at the Athenaeum. But at that point, we were just reading it. Uh, we do it with lecterns. Mm -hmm. I put it away. I put it downstairs in the basement. Almost 20 years later, during the pandemic, when we're all at home, I went down to my basement, started cleaning things out. I found this script again, and I thought, why not do this? Why not bring this back? I had by that time made friends with an organization in Rhode Island called Lifelong Learning Collaborative, and they were doing everything on Zoom. Mm -hmm. So I said, I know an actor in Rhode Island, the great uh, Fred Sullivan, shout out to Fred. Uh, I said, well, I know he's equity, but maybe, maybe he'll, he'll do this play with me. I, I gave up my union memberships a long time ago. Um, and he did. He read the play, he read my version of it, and he said, I love this, and I'll do it. And he, at that point, was sporting a great <laughs> Shaw beard. So it was perfect for him. Um, so we did it. Uh, I had done Golda's Balcony for Lifelong Learning uh, maybe just like a few months previous. So we did this and we had, you remember COVID when everything was sure. on Zoom, right. 300 devices signed up, which means that if there was one device, maybe there were two or three people watching, watching on that yes. one device. Yes. So that was the hugest audience. I'd ever done that play for. Mm -hmm. And we got great feedback, and it's a great organization. So put that away, and I thought, why not do this on stage memorized? Why not get an actor who can you know, give me a Shaw right. where we can actually play it? So I, uh, I called up a friend, actually through Fred, uh, Richard Noble, um, was the second Shaw, it was the third Shaw, Oh my God, I'm on the fourth Shaw now. Um, uh, Richard Noble said, yes, I love this play. We met in Westerly Park and we read it out loud and people started to gather because they were interested. What are these people doing? So he, that was last summer. And then last November, we did it in an interim weekend at the Granite Theater in, okay. in Rhode Island. Right, in the Westerly. And and it was wonderful, and it was great to get it up on its feet. Um, and unfortunately, Richard has had to uh, uh, stop doing it. Mm -hmm. He has moved up to Vermont. And I, was, I had uh, plans to take this with me. We have a date in uh, Newport to do it, and we had a date to do it in Mystic, July 9th and 10th, right? right and we'll, right. we'll show that uh, in a minute. Uh, my friend John Bale, who is the producer for Red Balloon's production, also harkens back to New York, said, yes, let's do this in my house. 
you did Golda, you did Golda's mm -hmm. Balcony in my house in a mm -hmm. very intimate salon setting. This is perfect, these letters, to do it in, uh, in Mystic at John's house. So I thought, yeah, let's do it. And that's where you and I began <laughs> talking about it again. And then all of a sudden Richard said, uh, it's not going to work for me. I'm moving. It's too much. So I thought, oh my God, what am I going to do? This is now when I take you back 40 years ago to Northwestern to that production of Hair <laughs> with Rob Mendel, and maybe we can show uh, the picture of, um, of, the, uh, the, of the, red, the poster, the poster with Rob, there, we there go. he is. There he is. Rob Mendel, perfect, he's also sporting the great white beard. Mm -hmm. Rob Mendel has had an illustrious career in LA as a production manager, as a location manager, as an assistant director, second AD, for TV, movies, um, just a smart, great, excellent, excellent, talented guy who understands theater and understands entertainment. And even though he's not an actor, I said, Rob, would you even consider doing this favor for me? I was visiting him. He, he, six months out of the year, he's up on the Cape. Six months out of the year, he's back in uh, LA. He's retired now. Mm -hmm. he, he took care of his parents for 10 years. He wrote a book about elder care, in oh. fact. I said, Rob, will you help me out? And he said, well, give me the script. Five minutes with the script, he recognizes that George Bernard Shaw is a fabulous character and could mm. be fun to play. He says, yes, I'll do it for you. So thank goodness Rob Mendel has stepped in in the role of George Bernard Shaw. Right. And he will be who you'll see uh, when you go. And I urge you to take a picture of the screen now and uh, check this out. It's Saturday, July 9th at 7 p.m. And Sunday the 10th, so it's coming up in like two weeks. At three in the afternoon, there will be a wine reception in this gorgeous old Victorian home. We perform the play in the parlor. And the phone number is on the, uh, on, on the poster as well to call for reservations. John <laughs> Bale is our um, kind, kind, generous host and producer. And, uh, um, and Rob is coming down from the Cape in his camper. He's an old hippie, like, like all of us. I mean, ask us about how we did hair, and yeah. I can tell you stories about that. He's going he's gonna to live out of his camper, run the uh, electricity into the house, <laughs> not put John out at all in terms of giving him a room, and we're going to rehearse on Friday. I've been rehearsing with him a couple of times up in the Cape, um, but we'll rehearse on Friday, Saturday. Actually, he's coming out next Wednesday. And we'll be ready for you. Um, and the Friday telephone number is there: three four seven two three zero two three eight eight. That's the phone number That's to call it. That's for it. reservations. And uh, it, are they required? And the Can you just show well, up? Well, it's because it's a house. Mm -hmm. This is the new thing, you know. I went to a piano recital. Um, great, great friend of mine, concert pianist, did a house recital. And it only held about you know 25 or 30 people. Well, right. this is the same thing. You need to call your make to make your reservation because the house only holds a select number of people. We don't want to turn you away. And we don't want to turn you away. Yes, Very reasonable absolutely. price for wine reception and uh, an hour and ten minutes of the most beautiful language and a beautiful relationship. Should we talk about their relationship? Absolutely. Absolutely. Enlighten us because that will make Campbell. people interested. Yes, yes. Well, she is a hoot to play. Mrs. Patrick Campbell is the stage name. And of course, these actresses in the late 19th century took these names because then being an actress was as close to being a woman of ill repute, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. So to. Um, you know, make everything uh, formalized and on the up and up. She took her first husband's name, who was Patrick Campbell, um, and I'll tell you what happened with him because he left her high and dry, which was part of the reason she went on to. And there she is on the right. There's George Bernard Shaw. We all recognize G.B. Shaw, but on his right is a picture of uh, Mrs. Patrick Campbell. 
She was this famous, famous actress. She made her fame for 20 years in the late 1800s uh, up to 1914, and then she had to tour up to the First World War in Britain, in mm -hmm. England. And she was a natural. She worked by instinct. She went on the stage at age 22 or 23 because she had to. Um, Bella, what was her first name? Bella Rose Stella Tanner. Uh, her father was um, a British officer who worked as a contractor for the British West Indies Company. And there was a little bit of a fortune there, which he spent, like two fortunes that he frittered away. Her mother was an Italian beauty, uh, also from um, aristocratic Italian lineage. But by the time we got to Stella, mm -hmm. there was no money. Right. She married at 20 because she was pregnant mm -hmm. with her first child, uh, Alan, who she called Bayo. Uh, who she would lose in the First World War, mm. and that's part of the play. But anyway, she had to go on stage because Patrick Campbell left her high and dry. Um, she gave birth. He went to Australia to try to make his fortune. Never really came back. Spent 13 years in Australia, India, basically a ne'er-do-well. Mm -hmm. Left her high and dry. She was, she was a single mother for all intents and purposes. She, however, was probably a savant in some way. She um, was musically gifted. She played piano. She had a little bit of schooling at the Guild Hall, musical uh, uh, schooling. But she left school at like 15. She was an avid reader. Mm -hmm. So she began to memorize pieces also from uh, novels, from Russian novels. And her first attempt at being on stage was just doing like a 20 minute, um, I'll call it an aria, but a verbal piece that she put together based on some Russian novel, I think, I don't know who it was. And she was a hit, she was a smash hit. And she booked herself into, like I was talking about, booking myself right. into libraries right. and guild halls and Becoming your own producer. She had to make her own way. So she was a hit with that and from there, um, she got attention as being uh, an actor. She never had any kind of formal training. Right. She worked by instinct, I think, and she was extremely emotional. She was extremely musical. And the critics, and Bernard Shaw was one of her first critics, loved her when she was great, panned her when she was bad. <laughs> so she knew about him. Uh, for years before he asked her, she was 49 years old okay. in 1914 when he asked her, and, and he was inspired by her when she was younger, he asked her to play his Eliza Doolittle in Pygmalion. Okay. Right? This is yes. pre prior to My Fair Lady. Right. The original so he version. came to yeah. her house and he uh, fell in love with her. In the first 30 seconds, he <laughs> says in, in my play. Okay. And from then on, they began a 40-year relationship which was unconsummated, mm -hmm. right? He was married to his wife, Charlotte. She was, had been married to Patrick Campbell for many years, but he died, mm -hmm. right, in the Boer War. Okay. Never came back. Right. Um, she was unmarried. She was her own stage manager and um, producer, and she booked herself uh, on tours, and she um, was in England on um, the London stages, and she was in Ireland on the best stages there, playing, and I say this in the play, antiquated, meaningless. You, you wouldn't know the second Mrs. Tangeray, mm -hmm. and you wouldn't know Fedora. Uh, but you would know Juliet and Lady Macbeth and um, who else did she play? Beatrice, Much Ado. Um, so she was a Shakespearean actress as well. Um, George Bernard Shaw put her in as Eliza Doolittle and right before they start rehearsing they had this 18 month affair, we'll call it an affair, that was him visiting her in her boudoir, 
right? Because yeah. she she had gotten into a uh, an accident in a London cat taxi cab, smash, and I tell the story in the play. On her way to play on stage, she got into this um, accident. She had to go, her cancellation for Belladonna, which was the play that she was doing then. She had to spend four months Oof. recovering from her car accident, car accident yes. her cab accident. And during that time, Bernard Shaw went to visit her. Mm -hmm. and wrote her letters. And that, I think, is where they fell in love, because she wrote him back. And did they visit? Yes. Mm -hmm. In her boudoir? Yes. But he was not interested in the physical. Mm -hmm. He was interested in his romance with her as... May I read something? Absolutely. That I, this Abs is not in the play, but I came upon it... Um, I came upon it when I was doing my research. This is what George Bernard Shaw says about Stella Campbell. He says, I want my dark lady. I want my angel. I want my tempter. I want my Freya with her apples. I want the lighter of my seven lamps of beauty, honor, laughter, music, love, life, and immortality. I want my inspiration, my folly, my happiness, my divinity, my madness, my selfishness, my final sanity and sanctification, my transfiguration, my purification my light across the sea, my palm across the desert, my Stella. <laughs> uh, and, and, and so she says at one point, she says, my goodness, darling, um, there's nothing to do but love you and accept you, but when you were quite a little boy, somebody ought to have said hush just once. <laughs> uh, so they were a match. They were passionate, um, tempestuous, difficult people, but when it came to their work, they inspired each other. And that's what inspired me to write the play. And I, I have the line, love and work and immortality. It's very rare that people can balance that in their lives, mm -hmm. their passion or their love for each other um, uh, with their calling. And that's what they did. Uh, for 40 years, at least in the letters. So it's been uh, a and of pleasure. Course, the, the idea of using love letters yeah. as, a, as a jumping off point for plays, for books, yes. um, is, is, is been around for Time very, honored. For, yeah. One yeah. of the very few, um, my examples of using that, I had a guest on who read, I was the narrator, she she acted the part of her grandmother. Mm -hmm. We got an actor to do her grandfather, and we read love letters that he had written to her during the Civil War. Oh wow! And that was an incredibly talk about uh, giving that was, history. Oh, that's a human the way face. to learn. Yes, yeah. and, and he dressed and she dressed the part. I was just uh, oh beautiful. You know, since I was a narrator, I was just wearing regular clothes, and I sat between them, and it was. It was wonderful. It was just absolutely wonderful. There's so wonderful. many instances of that where you can give life to a time in history through the letters that people wrote to each other. At this point, you know, we text, we, yes. we email. Yeah. Email is even yeah. out of fashion now. Right, right. But back then, they took the time to think to, um, you know, the, I think there's a connection between the brain and the hand. I teach my high school students that, <laughs> you know, they're all, they're typing on their laptops, but I, every once in a while we'll put the machines away. There's something that happens when you write something out. And of course, actors know this, to memorize a part, sometimes you'll just write out the whole part to memorize it. It's a, it's a, great, it's a great ploy, and, and, and it can be an extremely effective way. Absolutely. Um, I'm sorry that she didn't go on and do more with it, but uh, she had, it was in her possession. I guess she got it from her mother or grandmother. Oh, or somebody. that's precious. And of course, the war went on for years, and yeah. during the course of, and he did come back, so he didn't, he oh, didn't wow. die, so he did come back. And she married him, uh, uh, like when she was, in those times, like, 15 or 16 years exactly. old. Exactly. And he must have been 18 or 19, and he had no choice, but he had to go. He fought for the Union Army, so, yes. There were these other instances I've read about in history where there were these very, very old Civil War veterans who came back alive, 
and who would marry again, but to very, very young women, and it's them in like the 20th century who come back with the stories and the letters because, uh, because of their aged husband. Yes. It's funny, I went to the Hale House uh, just last weekend on um, Route 1 in Charlestown, Rhode Island, and that's a famous, famous house. It's a historic landmark now. Um, I think uh, Hale was an author, an abolitionist, and he hosted his ten children there and all of their friends and uh, people who would come there and uh, paint. They were a family of painters. And there's one woman who uh, wrote a book based on her experiences at the Hale House. So I'm thinking maybe that's my next project. Ah, we'll see. I see. Now we've we'll had see. we have had on this show other actresses um, who have come and done their one person shows yeah. or talked about them and they actually were doing it somewhere else. But yes. Definitely. It becomes, well, I would imagine that you have a lot of control. I mean, you, you're not only the actress, yeah. but you can many times, you are the playwright, you are the producer. <laughs> you, you may not be the director. For some reason, that seems, to, you, you let I that had, one go and you let someone else be the director. But the rest of the pieces, mm, you want control over. We had a director for Campbell Shaw, talk about full circle. Remember I told you I started a theater company, the Classic Works Theater Company, yes. 40 years ago or more? That director, Anthony Naylor, uh, who lives in England now uh, and has a business with you know corporate coaching, he on Zoom directed us, directed uh, Richard and myself, and he was so good and it's so, it's so interesting. Zoom has its weaknesses, but you know, it was really interesting rehearsing um, uh, with the text in front of us and him listening to us and us getting uh, now the problem was of course that he wasn't there um, to really watch you in the full really watching us physically mm. you know move um, but no this time with Rob I think we're sort of directing ourselves Rob is the kind of mind since he's a second AD He's got ideas, man. He's he's coming up with a million ideas. So it'll be interesting what that what that looks like. And of course, the audience is all around us right. at the house. Mm -hmm. um, so instead of just playing proscenium out to the stage, right. and because our audience is right next to us, we can deliver the information right to you, then to him, then to this one. Uh, we can walk around, go into the dining room, and be seen by everyone. So it's a really interesting venue. Are you going to be mic'd? No, we don't need no, to be mic'd. No, you don't need mics. We don't need mics. It's that close that you, yeah. don't, you don't need any kind of amplification. Yeah. Well, that gives you a certain kind of freedom, too, right? Absolutely. Not to be... It's funny. I just went... Oh, Harriet, I had a beautiful experience, and this is somebody I'm going to recommend to you, the Michael Chekhov Association had workshops all last week, and I think this week online at Khan College. And my friend Jessica Cirillo um, did um, a pandemic project called Ships in the Night. Mm -hmm. And I want her on here. I want you to interview her. Anyway, she is an associate um, um, uh, director at the Michael Chekhov organization. Michael Chekhov was a brilliant actor, director, teacher of a technique that takes from Stanislavski and moves it forward with psychological gesture and body centeredness. So I was very privileged to uh, take a couple of workshops this past weekend. And I bring that up because Stella Campbell, I uh -huh. think, was that kind of actor. When she was bad, she was terrible because she got bored easily. Uh, she didn't have the willpower or the technique that we learn as actors to discipline. repeat and repeat and repeat the discipline, discipline. exactly. Yes, yes. This fiery, wild temper. But when she was good, man, she was brilliant. So to bring that technical means to uh, express the psychological, uh, emotional depth of what a character is going through, I think is the apex of, of any actor. So I'm never as good as I want to be. I keep growing in the role, and that's the other reason why I wrote it, because 
she's fantastic to be able to play her and that language and to hone it and to keep getting better and better each time I do it, that's, that's everything to me. Right. You right. never stop. You never stop. There's do no you, th such thing as perfection. Is there something in uh, your uh, multifaceted career that you like more than anything else? Do you prefer to act? Do you like to teach? I mean, do you like everything the oh, same I way? Oh, I love teaching. I still get goosebumps when I'm with my, my high school students and they're getting it. And it is four shows a day. I mean, you have four classes. Teachers will know this. Mm -hmm. You are, for all intents and purposes, performing a lesson and giving it to your audience, which are your students. But then they need to be engaged. And to engage them, they need to feel your passion. They need to, they remember the person, maybe, not, not the content sometimes. So, um, yeah, I love teaching still. I love um, when students are fired up by uh, the literature that I teach. And we teach everything. We still teach the great novels. We still teach debate and argument. I teach um, Sojourner Truth uh, speeches. I teach Susan B. Anthony speeches. And uh, a good friend of mine, Kim Johnson, shout out to Kim, is a teaching artist in New York. And she will embody a historical figure and she'll go into the classrooms as a teaching artist educator and she'll play out those letters or she'll play out the speeches and the kids are wrapped because it's dramatic right is there something that you notice since you've been teaching for so many years have you noticed some kind of change in in the students in huh. their interests um, are they more bored now because it's, you know, there's too many distractions in I their I think lives? they'll say it themselves. And, you know, it was visionary 10 years or more when our superintendent, rest in peace, Barry Ritchie, expanded us to one-to-one, -to -one, right? One teacher with a laptop, each student with a laptop. Mm -hmm. We, like your show, like YouTube, we can reach the world. But the students will say it themselves. Their mm. devices, their phones, the digital world is, has gotten them into trouble, psychological trouble, because of social media, because attention span is so short. Um, but they themselves will know when to put it away. And then I feel it, you know, when to, when to put the devices away and when we need to just talk to each other, when we need to just read. Um, yeah, I think there's... Of course, we've gained something and we've lost something with the digital world and with the internet. Is there something that the, uh, you find the students are really interested in? It, uh, when they come to, to acting, are they thinking like uh, when I was a kid and I was playing the clarinet, I'm thinking I'm gonna make, I'm gonna make a great record, I'm gonna become a millionaire. Uh, <laughs> right, when you're yes. you know, 16 years old, your mind I is had, set I had, like that. I had a great student who wants to be the next hip hop you know, YouTuber. So I'll tell you the truth, he wouldn't do his paper so much. He wouldn't do his, you know, uh, a little trouble there with getting the grades up to where they needed to be. But man, he was talented with the, um, with the music and with um, the way they know how to manipulate tracks and, you know, a YouTuber. Right. So, right. yeah, they, they, well, they know like how you, to you do could, that. You can play at it, but do you... Is, is something like Hemingway of interest to a 15-year-old, oh, 16-year-old who's in the class now? Is, is sh how is Shakespeare even to produce all those plays? Do, does anybody who's 16 years old care about Shakespeare? Do they care about Hamlet? Do we, they know even who Richard III is? My colleagues and I, you know, my, my teacher friends and I, we trade costumes, um, and we will perform it with them. And once they put on the crown, once they're able to fight with our foam daggers, they get it. Okay. And they love it. And it's, it's speaking. It's, I think the act of speaking, articulating this language, um, it does something different to the body and to the mind. You know, it's different from reading. It's different from writing. If you can speak it, you own it in mm -hmm. a way. You embody it. So, um, so that's a pleasure. Um, what's that Hemingway short story, The White Hills? Um, you know, the subtext there is abortion. And I don't know whether we would 
be allowed to teach it in some school systems now. You know the way schools are going. Yes, yes, yes. Um, I think there is uh, a portion, a greater portion of parents who understand that literature is universal. It's there for us to um, be human, to feel out and play out all the ideas that we possibly can. Um, and they're controversial ideas, but they're human. And to cut that off, to ban it, or to say we can't teach Huckleberry Finn because it has the N-word in it, well, we have a way of dealing with that because Mark Twain is a treasure. And so don't ban these books. Don't ban the literature that teaches us how to be human beings. Um, and as, I think that's as, a, as that's a question. As you've been teaching, have you been hitting more and more controversy? I mean, you, we, we're well, a part of New England, which is relatively yeah. liberal about things like uh, language and books yeah. and plays. But have you, have you noticed some subtle changes that are occurring even in supposedly liberal New England? I, I think that along with the rest of the country, we are all feeling looking over our shoulders at the small, at the minority, and I will say it's a minority, of people who are watching us for um, ideas that they deem uh, inappropriate. And, uh, you know, during the pandemic, I, uh, and post, um, you know, Black Lives Matter protests, post George Floyd protests, I felt I wanted to teach an 11th grade literature that was suitable and appropriate for what everybody had just gone through, which was seeing an uprising after that murder. So I taught James Baldwin, and I taught Tanahasi Coates, and I taught it on the back of, of teaching Huckleberry Finn, which is in the curriculum. And I had guests come on. These were Zoomed guests. Mm -hmm. And they were fabulous. I don't know if you know the name uh, Keith Stokes. He's a Rhode Island historian um, who's very much responsible for the black history, black heritage curriculum in Rhode Island. He came on and spoke. A um, gentleman named John Mills from Stonington, an amateur historian, searching for his ancestors' uh, gravestones in cemeteries that are unmarked across the country for uh, black people. Mm -hmm. uh, he came on and gave uh, a talk. Uh, we had representatives, um, women representatives, women of color up from, from Providence gave talks. And I will say, I gave that all spring. There were about 12, and we read Stamped, right? Um, the, the novel that was the Rhode Island read, Summer for, for Reading. And there was some controversy there. I have to confess, that summer, my principal asked me to come in because there had been some question about what Ms. Laub is teaching. And I did, and everything was above board. I shared the videos, I shared the recordings, I shared my curriculum, and, um, and I never heard again that there was any trouble. But to your question, uh, do we look over our shoulders? Unfortunately, last year, we did. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I just think that um, kids, by denying them what is our legacy, that's right. the good, bad, and indifferent that we, and literature rather than sometimes history class is probably an easier way to right. get kids engaged and get them to understand something rather than for them to be, you know, studying the American Civil War, which we do a poor job of teaching anyway. So yeah. I always think it's better to embody that, like you were talking about the letters of the Civil War. Mm -hmm. uh, if you can teach history, you know, by embodying it, by dramatizing it, and literature the same way, um, that would be, I think that's, because we have to compete in the classroom with the phones, with the social media, with attention spans that are, have gotten shorter and shorter. And don't forget, Harriet, there's, there's a mental health crisis across this country that uh, teenagers are feeling the brunt of. And so the more we um, uh, care, I think, for our young people in ways that maybe we haven't mm -hmm. uh, in the past, and the way to do that is in the classroom, to get the parents more involved, to get the um, students to 
um, enjoy the eight hours, six, eight hours that they spend every day in a, in a high school, which is where I teach. Um, I think, uh, you know, we have to support public education in that way. Yeah. 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 It's, uh, well, we live in strange times. Very strange, strange times. times right? So we're going to divert our, our attention to some, some theater so let's, uh, in a couple let's weeks. Put, yeah, so let's get uh, this, this out again. Mrs. Campbell and Mr. Shore, we're going to have it presented. There's the dates on Saturday, July 9th at 7 p.m., and Sunday, July 10th at 3 p.m. You need to telephone just to make your reservation. So give us a call, 347-230-2388. And this will be presented in a beautiful old house in Mystic, not too far from most people. Yeah. Uh, it, will it be Zoomed in any way? No, we, we might post something if somebody can take a, a little phone movie, but um, otherwise, uh, yeah, that's it. We look forward to seeing you there. I look forward to seeing you there. We'll do a talk back afterwards, wine reception before, and it'll be very enjoyable, fast, hour and 10 minutes, no intermission. Very enjoyable. Good. Very theater. good. So we're looking forward to everybody showing up. Yeah. You hold the households 25, 30 seats. Yeah, so make your reservation. Yeah, make your yeah. reservation quickly now that you got the information out there. Thank you so much, Harry. Well, it's Sandra, been such a it's pleasure. been an absolute pleasure to have you on the show. I wish you the very best. I will be there. Yay. I will be there because I'm very interested in taking um, uh, not necessarily letters, but something that's been written and make it into a performance piece. I've done it myself. I'm a, yeah. a writer of crime stories. Yep. And I created a performance piece taking on the role of the police detective huh. in, um, in like a 30-minute, how is it, what's it like to be a cop in New York City? You should deliver that to the criminal justice program at my high school. Okay, I'll, I'll be happy to that. Do, do that. They would love that. And well, I just want to let everybody know that I'm still teaching creative writing at Pawkatuck Neighborhood Center. It's absolutely positively free. It's Wednesdays at 11 o'clock. We look forward to having you come and join us and sharing your ideas. I've got people in there waiting to write their the diaries for their grandchildren, people wanting to write about tragedies in their life. Whatever you want to write about, I, uh, I, I promote that. And I often give you um, assignments, which nobody seems to take seriously, <laughs> including writing, reading and writing assignments. So come on. It's absolutely fun. Um, if you think I'm a hoot here, I'm even better in person. <laughs> so I want to thank everybody for watching. This is Harriet Grayson, your host and producer, Community Culture Showcase. Bye-bye. See you soon.